words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be all acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Well, as we know, it is the first Sunday after Easter. It is called a low Sunday for a lot of reasons, not, not the least of which we had such a buildup through Lent all the way to Easter Sunday that I think people are just worn out and, and, and need a Sunday. <laughs> but then we also know that there are those who can't be with us uh, due to illness and traveling and all of that. Uh, but this is our first Sunday after Easter. And, and when I think about uh, making, ex and how many of you have actually heard a litany of excuses from, from children about why they can't do something? Uh, I, I know uh, I've heard my fair share, even sometimes from colleagues, uh, interestingly, and no doubt I'm sure some excuses have come out of my lips. Um, and uh, I see the facial expression on Tracy's face. Yep, she, she would agree. But then there was a, a, a big excuse that, that was made during World War II. It was one of those big three conferences. I think that was at Yalta, if, if memory serves. That was where, uh, where FDR, uh, that is Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, they, they were trying to work with, the, with Stalin uh, to get him to agree with one of the proposed strategies in order to defeat the, the Nazis. And when Stalin gave his reason or excuse for not agreeing with them, with them, they said, that is no reason for your refusal. Stalin replied with a story of two Arabs. One Arab asked the other to lend him his rope. The other Arab replied, uh, I can't, I need it to tie my camel. And the first Arab says, but you don't have a camel. And then, the second Arab said, well, I know that, but when you don't want to lend your rope, one excuse is as good as another. So, so that's pretty much for excuses. But how many times, and I've certainly seen this uh, within the, the sphere of, of evangelism, within the ministry of evangelism, and for those of us involved with EE, you know of what I speak. Uh, there are many excuses that are offered as to why people will not believe in the gospel or what, not even believe in God that often fall into the same category. And they reveal that um, they simply do not want to believe what his word tells us to believe or what he commands us to do. And that reminds me of, of what we read in question three of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which, which reads, what do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. And when it comes to truth with a capital T, you can't make excuses in the face of truth unless you're simply making a moral decision to not believe because hardly is it an intellectual decision when there are so many infallible truths uh, as to the, the truth of the empty tomb. Because as I had mentioned last week on Easter Sunday, the empty tomb itself could not have stood the test of time if the authorities would have found his corpse. The fact of the matter, our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he walked for 40 days, appearing to more than 500 living witnesses prior to his ascension. And any one of these witnesses would have been available for questioning or for cross-examination, if you will. Because our entire faith hinges on the fact of the resurrection, the fact of the empty tomb, without which we have no basis of belief in anything other than an empty religion with rituals lacking any significance whatsoever. What we believe about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as the incarnate Son of God, as the risen Christ, matters because our doctrine will affect our practices because what's the point of believing if it's not true but we know it's true in fact it was the empty tomb itself that put me over the top back when i was 28 years old i couldn't wrestle with the fact that there was an empty tomb because had they found the body we wouldn't even be talking about it right now so with that in mind let's turn to page 170 in your prayer books if you're following along and i'll be reading out of first uh, john chapter 5 verses 4 through 12. That will be our text uh, for this morning. And by way of introduction, John's first general epistle 
speaks authoritatively about the truth of the incarnation. And that's important because that was a message that John wrote uh, to doubting readers uh, and they needed to hear the truth, especially after hearing from, from the Gnostic false teachers who denied the full divinity and humanity of Christ. It reaffirms the core of the Christian faith saying that either we exhibit the sound doctrine and the obedience to what the scriptures teach and the love that characterizes all Christian believers, or else we might have good reason to examine our faith to see if we're actually in our faith and to make our calling and election sure in order to be assured of the fact that we are true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when all the basics of the faith operate in us not only can we experience the joy, but actually live the holy lives and have greater assurance of our salvation, even though we are far from perfect because we do sin in our thoughts, words, actions, and attitudes by the things that we're supposed to do that we don't do, the sins of omission, and that which we are commanded not to do, which we do anyway because we want to. That would be the sins of commission. So, so in either case, whenever we fall short and the Holy Spirit brings that sin to our attention, then, then be assured that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we see earlier in John's first epistle, chapter one, verse nine. Well, let's pick up in our epistle passage, chapter five, beginning at verse four. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So what does it mean to be born of God? Well, this is belief that Jesus is the Christ uh, we don't simply believe that as a mere intellectual assent to the facts, but rather our faith itself is a work of the Holy Spirit who opens our hearts and minds to respond to the gospel. And, and it's the Holy Spirit himself uh, who empowers us to not only believe, but also to radically transform us more into the image of Christ. It is what we call a rebirth or a new birth, which is what is called theologically regeneration, or simply what we would also call as being born again. When Nicodemus visited Jesus at night, he acknowledged that he was a teacher sent from God, which was evident by his many miracles, his many signs and wonders. And Jesus's reply to Nicodemus was this, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Jesus also said later in chapter 6, in verse uh, 44, he said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Our faith is an outgrowth of that work of the Holy Spirit, which is a gift from God himself. And this is the same faith which generates the love of God in us and enables us to fulfill his commands. And this is closely linked to the belief that Jesus is the risen Son of God. And the apostle alluded to the actions of the Son of God by which he conquered sin and even empowered his disciples to share in the fruits of his victory, as he wrote earlier in chapter 2 of this same epistle. And I pick up at verse 13. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is born from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. In each phrase, we apply the simple truth that we can know God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ and in the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, being strong in our faith, 
with God's word firmly hidden in our hearts. And that is what renews our minds. It's God's word working in us through the power of the Holy Spirit to renew our minds and to change our hearts. And we have all of the spiritual resources. We have all of the spiritual resources to overcome the threefold enemy, which is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear the devil. Why? He was defeated on the cross. And the tomb could not contain our Lord. All right, let's move on now in our epistle to the sixth verse of chapter five of uh, John's first letter. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Okay, so what does that mean? That a, has a very mysterious meaning to it, but not really when you, when you unpack it, because when we think of the baptism of John, that, that was a, a baptism of re repentance that he ministered to the people to prepare the way for the Lord. And Jesus did not need repentance being sinless, but he received the baptism of John in order to fulfill all righteousness. But then we also see not only in the water of baptism, but also in the blood of the crucifixion, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And this is what we see in the phrase, this is he that came by water and blood. And that concentrates the attention of the reader of this epistle upon the significance of the water and the blood rather than upon merely the historical incidents, even though they're historically accurate, because water symbolizes purification and blood symbolizes both purification and life. And the life and death of Jesus, he was the perfect conqueror over sin, and he attained and exhibited uh, that conquest to the entire world on the cross. But for those who believe in Jesus, far more is indicated. They have shared in this victory through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God and the symbolism of water and blood is, is often used to explain the effects of this inspiration, which involves an intimate union of the believer with the Son of God and points to the life and death of the Lord as its source. So what does that mean to us? Well, that makes our relationship with the Lord deeply personal rather than distant. He's not some distant deity like other religions would see their deity, their God with a little g, if you will, because we must remember that anytime we are praying to the Lord, that we are praying to our Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we remember that when we pray, whether that's through the prayer offices, the prayers and the thanksgivings that we see in the prayer book, and including even the family prayers in your same prayer book, or even the impromptu prayers whenever we pray, we pray to a Lord who is personal, one who is not distant or aloof to our needs or desires, but our sorrows, but one we may boldly approach in our time of need through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is exactly why we, we need all the more to read the scriptures, to sing or say the Psalms, to pray the offices, that the more and more we will be inclined to go to the Lord in prayer as a matter of habit, rather than merely a last resort, you know, or what I would call a foxhole prayer. Yeah, back when I was basic training, yeah, I had faith in God, it's like, oh God, just get me through this. Okay, but that was not the same kind of saving faith. So, so again, we develop those habits, we develop those spiritual disciplines so that it's instinctive to us to go to the Lord in prayer anytime we, we need to express our cares. In other words, we lay all of our cares in the Lord. Why? Because he cares for us. He loves us.
In the Gospel according to John, chapter 19, verses 25 through 37, the beloved disciple, uh, as the forerunner of those who would believe, stood at the foot of the cross and saw the water and the blood pour forth from the side of Jesus on Calvary and watched him bend his head and give up his spirit. When the Lord Jesus said, Lord, receive my spirit, the spirit, the water, and the blood bear witness to the completion of the perfect sacrifice and to the benefits which are secured by it. And we allude to that all throughout the liturgy and Holy Communion. The death of the Son of God, the blood, and not merely the perfection of his life, water, is emphasized as the source of the victory of the Christians over sin and the cause of their rebirth, our rebirth, not with water only, but with the water and the blood. And to this, the Spirit bears continuous witness to the experience of those of us who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, thus the Spirit who is given by Jesus, the water of purification, and the blood of the new transformed life form a threefold witness to the truth. They are how the life of the Son of God is communicated to us and of this communication, baptism and the Eucharist are offered as effectual symbols and means of grace for us, especially in the Eucharist as we receive it by faith. The Lord works in that to minister us. We receive the Eucharist in order to receive life. Now, when we also think of the concept of the threefold witness, we also think of uh, what we read also in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6. And the number of witnesses required to corroborate oral testimony in the Old Testament law and to establish the truth of such testimony from fact witnesses, from eyewitnesses. And I quote, on the evidence of two witness or witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. And of course, uh, we, we saw what was contrary to that at the Lord Jesus' sham trial before Pilate. There is another witness uh, that we can read about. If you uh, Google Simon Greenleaf, uh, you'll see that he was uh, born in 1783. He died in 1853, and he was uh, very much an agnostic. And some would say he was an atheist uh, who believed the resurrection of Jesus Christ was either a hoax or a myth that could not possibly be true. No stranger to truth and to the proof of truth, Greenleaf was a principal founder of the Harvard School of Law and a world-renowned expert on evidence. And he studied to this day in most law schools, most of the good ones anyway. But he was challenged by one of his students one day to consider the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, Greenleaf set out to disprove it, but ended up concluding that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was indeed fact, not fiction. And this coming from a former agnostic. Let's read on in uh, chapter 5, verse 9 of our epistle this morning. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life in his, is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And actually, uh, verses 11 through 12, that was among one of the first of five memory verses that I worked on back when I was uh, in Navigators because I was discipled early on as, as an adult convert, and that's a good thing. So, so what, what it, what's essentially saying here, if a threefold human witness sufficiently establishes the truth of the matter, according to Deuteronomy 19.15, 
a threefold divine witness renders the unbeliever guilty of pro proclaiming God himself to be a liar. Not only did God authenticate his son, as is clear from the narrative of his life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, uh, seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses. And again, these same eyewitnesses were around for questioning and probably were questioned. Yet every one of us who believes has an authentic testimony, even of our own conversion. I know I do. The believer has passed from life to death and the new life which he has received through union with the Son of God is eternal life. Because Jesus did say, in my house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Where I go to prepare a place for you, where I go, there you will be also. So to that end, what we believe about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as the incarnate Son of God, it matters significantly because doctrine matters. What we believe matters, which is why I absolutely believe in the formularies that do include the 39 Articles of Religion as a statement or a confession of our faith. For those of us who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is finished work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, and trusting in him and him alone for our eternal life, meaning not trusting in our own merit because we have no merit to bring uh, to our salvation. But if we trust in him and him alone, and we are truly born again, and we exercise faith in the risen Christ, then we have the Son and we have eternal life. And the proof of that would be the fruits of the Spirit exhibited in our life. And certainly a con conviction of sin whenever we do fail to live up to God's certain uh, perfect standard. But you know what? Uh, we wouldn't believe if it weren't for the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to draw each of us to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. And, and believe me, I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't come to the Christian faith because I was smarter or better than, I, than my neighbor who didn't, but it was actually by his grace and mercy that I am here and that I stand before you today. So for, for those of us who have confessed and made a good confession that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, we should all have hope. This should give us hope because without hope, we can only have despair, especially when we face tragedy, when we face all manner of personal trials, and even the specter of death, which will, which could, and well, will rather, overtake us at any time. We don't know the day or the hour when we meet the Lord in the veil of death, but we do know that we, do know that we can be sure that if we were to die today, that we would have eternal life by simply trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Bottom line is that he loves us, not because we're good. <laughs> we know better than that. We are not innately good, but it's him who began a good work in us. And we are his because he loves us, because he loves us and he revealed himself to us. So whenever you feel like you're struggling, and even struggling in your sanctification, be assured of this, what's, what Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say might, it says will. And on that, we can hang our hat and have faith. Amen. We say this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.